to uh, welcome all of you here uh, to this special event. I understand that most students are very busy uh, as well as faculty with the end of the year, end of the academic year uh, final schedule and reports. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for attending this event. I also want to welcome to the campus uh, Professor Raul Reese, uh, who's visiting here, as well as other guests that we have from uh, other parts of the city and Southern California. Uh, my name is Carlos Aro. I was a uh, director here, assistant director here of uh, the center uh, from 1972 to 1982, 83. Uh, I uh, moved on from the center to another part of the campus where I was an assistant dean for 18 years. And then I came back to the center in 2002. I connected with uh, the director that we have now, Chuan Noriega, Professor Noriega, and I uh, worked together very closely for that period of time. So that was the end of my career at UCLA. I have retired. But I am still drawn back, especially for events such as this. Uh, they are meaningful to me. Uh, I was here during the time that these activities occurred here on campus. Um, I uh, knew the faculty that were involved, intimately involved. Uh, Juan Gomez Quinones being one of them, uh, Steve Losa being another, and. A uh, list of the faculty that remain at this campus were very much involved in what was going on. But uh, today's event, uh, I'm pleased to report, is uh, something that's uh, being studied and documented by uh, one of our doctoral students, uh, Jose Aguilar Hernandez, whom I just met. And uh, I want to thank you for documenting this part of our history. It's not only UCLA history, but it's also Chicano history uh, that most people outside of this room do not know. And it's amazing to me how when you travel outside of UCLA, the level of knowledge regarding Chicanos and Chicanas drops considerably. And it doesn't matter if you're in East LA, Boyle Heights or East LA, it doesn't matter if you're in the Valley, people don't know, don't know their own history. It doesn't matter where you go. People do not know, especially younger people do not know. And I'm speaking here, there are people here from the 60s that were uh, undergraduate and graduate students. I was a student here at UCLA during the Chicano movement. I know certain things. And when I offer a class on Chicano education, the first thing I ask is, do you know about the Mendes case of 1943 and 47? And they say, no. Very few students raise their hand. You know, very few students know that that's the precursor to the big case, the Brown decision. Right? Very few students know that it was a Mexican family that started that movement to desegregate the schools. Very few. But we're here to enlighten one another, to learn about this particular event that occurred in the 1990s. And we welcome all of you to share with us in this investigation of what occurred. So now I'd like to introduce, uh, I think, Jose, you're coming up? No? Oh, right behind me. <laughs> Uh, behind me is the woman that's, uh, that's very much involved in uh, all of the activities that we have here. She is the librarian for the Chicano Studies Center, the librarian of this uh, facility, and she's also involved in the collections development. We have well over 100 collections here at UCLA, the largest one being the Edward R. Roybal Collection. You can't imagine how much documentation is in that collection and how long it'll take to inventory it. But she's responsible for that. And so she's a woman in a very important position for the center. 
Incidentally, this center's library was one of the key motivators for students to act in the 1990s. There was a rumor about that the Chicano Studies library was going to be closed. That was a rumor. It was out there, and in fact, there, were, there was a possibility that this library would be closed in the early 1990s. That stimulated some action, because students were coming in here into the library to do their work, to do Chicano Studies research and writing. So, uh, this center was involved in a very intricate way to the activities that we're going to talk about today. But please understand that there are two Chicano Studies on this campus. There is the Chicano Studies Research Center, where you're sitting today. This library is part of the Chicano Studies Research Center. And the Chicano Studies Department, which is in Bunch Hall. That department provides the academic training so that you can earn your bachelor's degree and now you can earn your doctorate degree. So that's the academic program and this is the research center. This research center was established in 1969. 1969. The department was formally established, the academic department, the teaching department, was formally established when? 2005. That's when it went through all the rigorous review process and various committee levels, not only of the academic senate, but also uh, the administrative side, the chancellor's office. So all of these efforts finally, you know, the, the struggles that occurred in the early 1990s finally paid fruit 2005, 2005. Right, now let me introduce Lizette, Lizette Guetta, our very well-known librarian and archivist. Uh, well, thank you and um, welcome everyone. Um, like Carlos said, I'm the archivist and librarian here, and um, it's a busy job. I think I have more canas than when I started working here five years ago. But um, something I mentioned to Raul Ruiz, who I will be introducing um, earlier, this is his photography, is that a lot of the undergrads that have been trickling in all week and have been looking at the photographs say, oh, these are really cool photographs. You know what? What is it, or what, what happened in them? It just goes to show you even something as recent as 1993, you know, how easily history can be erased or forgotten. And it's really our jobs here at the center to make sure that we don't forget and that, you know, we continue to remember, you know, the, the different struggles and obstacles that we went through to be able to be here and to continue learning and developing scholarship. With that, um, I want to introduce the um, photographer, uh, Dr. Raul Ruiz, a Chicano um, scholar. Uh, he teaches at uh, CSUN and at Santa Monica Community College. Um, he is an activist, journalist, historian, um, among many other things, and a, and a great man. <laughs> um, he is a documentary photographer. He took these photographs of the 1993 hunger strike and you know, before that, he um, took many iconic uh, photographs during the 1960s and 1970s uh, Chicano movement. Uh, we're very uh, privileged and honored that he has allowed us to exhibit his photographs. And um, with that, I will let him um, make, tell you a little bit about the uh, photographs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the way this whole thing started with this particular exhibit, um, through Virginia Spina, who is also an old historian here at UCLA, uh, was interviewing me about some of the history that, that I've been involved with. And during that time, we had occasion to want to maybe surface some photography that I had shot. And in looking over, I had done this uh, photography of the hunger strike, um, but, but it's 
in a lot of cases you archive it and you say you're going to do something with it and uh, I never really did very much with it but in, in looking over some photography I, I noticed uh, the, the section on the uh, on the uh, hunger strike and I just thought it was really not because I shot it but good photography because it, I thought and I think that it captured what the hunger strike was all about um, a very very important uh, event um, where there was a lot of passion involved, a lot of um, um, determination on the part of uh, uh, what I saw, uh, a lot of students, but also community, community, very important. Um, and the issue was it was good, even then. I was a professor at CSUN, and I thought, hey, what students want is for the university to function as a real university and not one that pre-selects and excludes what I think has always been a problem in this country as far as our people, our history, our, uh, our role in this society. When we say we the American people, it usually means when you look at history, excludes us. Yet you know we have been very much involved in, in, in American history, but most major institutions, including this one of the foremost research institutions of the world, um, excluded the Mexican, absolutely excluded them. Not only excluded them, they include the research, they didn't hire people either, or very few anyway. As was the case in just about every major institution of higher education. Um, so when you see students really passionate about, hey, and you know, we matter, and we're important, we are alive, our families, have contributed. My father never went to college, never went to high school. Basically went to elementary school, but he was very much a, a railroad man in El Paso. I come from the El Paso Juarez area. And uh, we have a history. My grandfather founded the Machinist Union in El Paso uh, in a time when they hated Mexicans. They still do to some extent. The double pay system. None of that has really was re really recorded how our labor has been used, whether in railroads and agriculture or in manufacturing, so that when people grow up, you, you look to other people for role models, because you can't look at your own because there isn't any. But there is. It's just that it hasn't been documented and it hasn't been recorded, and and, and very little research has been done. Um, so a center such as this. And events such as this that happened 13 years ago uh, are very important because it puts aside the lie, the manufactured lie of racism and prejudice that has permeated the society, especially as it relates to us. Um, but, but I'm sure we can say that is true about many other groups. But I'm focusing on on the way it's treated us, especially in light of the fact that. We have the situation that's happened in Arizona, uh, where we outlaw, we ban uh, the study of Mexicans because supposedly that's criminal activity or un-American activity. But the same thing has been fought in Texas also, in Texas también, and quite frankly at Santa Monica College, where they have cut out all the Mexican studies course, as it was told to me in my face. We are going to de-emphasize the study of Mexicans. <laughs> and I said, what, what are you going to do? And to de-emphasize, we're going to have to get rid of you, basically. Uh, so I'm fighting there at Santa Monica College, and I'm suing that school, quite frankly, uh, for what I think is extraordinary efforts to uh, continue this uh, really injurious, what I think, criminal activity of, of trying to ex exclude uh, our role in American history. I am very much a part of Chicano study of Chicano <coughs> history. But I'm also part of what is American history. And we can never, and especially for the young historians that are coming up, ever think that uh, any history is valid that excludes uh, significant groups such as, certainly in this case, uh, the, uh, the Chicanos, the Mexicanos, uh, but also the role of uh, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and the great role of women in this society. What is it? I just one word about la mujer. 
You know, when I shot this photographer, I, I, I've done a lot of shooting, regardless of what anybody will say. I have photographed more than anybody else the Chicano movement, period. And I know there's a lot of people that have done also good work. But I do not stay, take one step back as far as my documentation on what my people have contributed. When I came here and I saw, I'm not from UCLA, but what I saw, I thought, I came here first and I just wanted to check it out and see what was going on. And I thought, this is really a, a valid, really a very significant action and uh, very dedicated, very passionate. So then I came back and I brought my camera. I spent days, basically. I, I sat in too, like some of the photographs, like that young lady over there with the baseball cap, it can't, can't kill the revolution, but you can't kill the, you can kill the revolution, but not the revolution. I just thought it was a cool shot. Uh, that's then there, one of the halls where we were sitting in. Um, the fact is that when I shot the photographer, I wasn't looking for the female uh, purposely. But what later on, as I developed the photographs and looking over, the role of la mujer is there. And it doesn't have to be something that you single out or, or put focus on. She contributes because she contributes. Uh, not because she's a woman, but because she's part of that stream of history which makes history valid only if we really understand it. And in this case, this, I believe, and, you know, and I'm sure that Pepe's uh, research will surface it, that this event could not have successfully taken place from what I, I little that I know, uh, the tremendous role of La Mujer, of women. Uh, they made it, uh, I think, successful. They made it valid. They brought credibility to it. Um, and um, I was just very happy that I was able to, I think, capture a little bit, because most of this is not post-shot. I don't know if you've ever done documentary photography. You, you try to capture something in a moment. It happens and then it goes away. And you try to, there was a couple of shots that I posed, the one on, uh, it's outside with Cobra's um, work now, who is I believe, by the way, has not been necessarily given the credibility and the acknowledgement of a tremendous role in the development of the Farm Workers Union. Cesar Chavez, absolutely, absolutely, the grand hombre que fue and committed, a member of our community, but no more in the role of the Lotus Worker. Such a house could never have been as successful as it was. Where is that? It's a tremendo trabajo at work. Because a lot of what people call movement activity Many times it's just work, and uh, maybe it's not necessarily that glorified role, but it's work that if it's not done, uh, um, a lot of events are not successful. And I think that the work that went here, it really reflects a lot of dedication on the part of students, but I really think that a lot of the dedication and commitment of um, a lot of women of various ages, by the way, there's a little picture of a, of a baby it, I think it came out in the, in the front page of the little advertisement. She was a little infant, and she had that T-shirt, you know, she kind of studied research centers, or she kind of studied school. Um, she was a few months old. She's a young woman of 20 years right now. And it would be to really, I also, I wish I could find that young woman. Uh, hopefully, you know, she should have been here, because for sure she was already protesting when she was a few months old. So. Uh, and I think that it, it really crystallizes what I think is uh, uh, a very important part of our, our Chicano, Chicana history, but especially the fact that we really have, even Chicano historians exclude that vital role of La Mujer. You know, I have daughters, you know, I have a mother, I have important women in my family that without them, uh, there is no familia. You know, I'm a father, I'm a grandpa, but I have always valued, and my, my family is very masculine, those are my you know, uh, but without, I think, the important women in my life and my family, they're, they're, we wouldn't have a family. So I'm very glad to be a part of this event, and I'm very glad that it's taking place here, and eventually all of this photography will be donated to the Research Center. Thank you very much. Dr. Ruiz. 
Um, now I'm going to uh, very quickly introduce um, our moderator, Jose Aguilar Hernandez, so most of us know him as Pepe, <laughs> who's actually doing um, uh, all the research uh, to document the hunger strike. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a dream come true for any doctorate student that you could have an event on the topic that you're studying. So this is, uh, I've been pinching myself all day since I woke up that I was actually going to be in this space with you all. So I want to thank you for being here. Um, and I want to just begin with a couple of remarks and introduce the panelists. First, I want to say that to, um, as a historian in training, I'm, I'm a storyteller. And my job is to tell stories. Um, and the stories that I choose to tell are the stories that, as the professors before, as Professor Otto and Professor Ruiz were saying, are the ones that are ignored and the ones that are marginalized. And as someone who has been formed in Chicana feminism, I'm specifically interested in the stories of mujeres. Um, and I'm interested in what is it that mujeres have contributed to our movements to understand where I'm at today. So I wanted to say that 20 years ago, this campus was alive with student activism. It was on fire. It was, it was, it was, um, I've seen the pictures, you're seeing the pictures, it was uh, months of people taking over the school. And I think that that's something that um, really moves me as someone who comes 20 years later. If we were to look out the windows here and look towards Murphy Hall, we would have seen an encampment of tents, of hundreds of people rotating 24 hours a day, seven days out of the week for two weeks protecting, arguing, um, negotiating with Chancellor Young, who said on file that there would be a Chicana Chicano Studies Department over his dead body. The students were out there. The community was out there. Uh, the United Community for Labor Alliance, the Mothers of East Los Angeles, a number of unions, um, uh, conscious students of color, Mecha, um, and a lot of student organizations were out there uh, making this happen. Uh, Mecha de Cerritos was out there. Mecha de East Los Angeles College was out there. This was a community event. It was a, it, it, it's not only a story of UCLA, this is a story of Los Angeles. This is a story of, 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 of our history, of our people. And what we would have seen, seen in that encampment is that a lot of people had renamed it either Freedom City, some of the hunger strikers I've been told called it Placita Aslan. And if we continue to look um, we'd see the arrival of about a thousand people who 20 years ago today, today, around this time, despite the rain, or hace calor 20 years later, but 20 years ago, despite the rain, a thousand people arrived from a pilgrimage from Olvera Street to the UCLA campus to show their support for the hunger strikers in the encampment. One of the demands that has been highlighted is, of course, the departmentalization for Chicana and Chicano studies. And with that demand was also the demand for continuing to support the ethnic studies centers like this one. This center was also at risk of being shut down, as well as um, the dropping of the charges of all the students who staged a sit-in at the faculty center um, uh, about a month prior to that. In, in, it was actually May 11th that they held a stage, uh, a stage sit-in. So the 14-day hunger strike was the culmination of years, and many historians in the room would argue decades of activism by various student leaders and community members alike. And what makes this movement unique is that it worked. Yeah. <laughs> That's huge. I studied many other movements, and there's a lot of stories there of struggle, but unfortunately in a lot of cases it didn't work. But at UCLA it worked. That's huge, and it inspired so many generations after us. So before I continue, I wanted to ask um, to acknowledge physically if any of you here were here at UCLA during the 1993 uh, hunger strike to please stand. Those of you that were here. Students or just in the community? That you were here, student, community. And next, I want to ask all of you that are students, staff, faculty, that are doing anything with Chicana and Chicano Studies here at UCLA to please stand. Let's give them a hand for doing that. Thank you. 
This moment is a full circle. This moment is a full circle. 20 years ago, faculty, staff, and members of the community pressured the administration to implement a department, to say, don't give us the scraps, don't give us the crumbs, give us a department. And today we see the fruit of the activism that these folks did. So at this point, I want to invite the panelists to join us. Um, if you give us a brief minute, we're gonna connect via Skype with one of our um, Chicana activists, one of our activist mujeres, activists that was here during the time as well. Um, but I want to invite Cindy Montañez and Josefina Santiago who are here. I will do the formal introduction in a second for them. And if it's possible to connect with, um, with uh, Christine as well. I'll just say that um, on behalf of, of myself and a community of people that are here today, I wanted to say thank you to the three of you um, for all the work that you did. Uh, we know that the movement means sacrificing relationships, sacrificing bodies, sacrificing uh, relationships, uh, studies, classes. But we want to thank you for believing in Chicana and Chicano studies as significant enough to organize and to lead and to do what you had to do. So um, I want to begin by introducing Christine Soto de Berry, who's here on Skype, who is currently the chief of staff for the San Francisco District Attorney, uh, George Gascon. Uh, who is San Francisco's first Latino district attorney. In her role, Christine is responsible for the overall operation with an emphasis on policy development and criminal justice system reforms. Uh, prior to it being involved in the San Francisco government, Christine spent five years as a public defender in Los Angeles and worked on statewide ballot measures and policy issues for the Center for Responsible Lending and Preschool California. She received her JD from UC Berkeley School of Law and her bachelor's degree here, of course, from UCLA. She is a native of Guatemala City, Guatemala, um, and has uh, uh, pride in being the wife of Stephen DeBerry and mother of two daughters, Cleo Valentina and Ella Quetzal. And Christine was one of the student negotiators who was elected by the hunger strikers that would work with the UCLA uh, administration to implement Chicana and Chicano studies at UCLA. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. So we'll just go ahead and get started and um, ask you to share um, your experiences at that time. Okay. All right, great. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with everybody. I'm jealous that you're having a mini reunion that I can't be part of, but um, happy to participate. And I want to um, start by thanking Pepe for really taking the time to study this and make it the focus of his dissertation. I think um, for myself, it really was an opportunity to reflect on the experience that we went through, and it's been 20 years now, and so a lot has happened. Obviously, all our lives have changed, but it was a really significant uh, experience in my own life, and I, I, I assume for all of us, and something that um, was nice to revisit and really give some thought to with some time to reflect. So uh, I'm proud to see that these are some of the outputs of the work that was done 20 years ago. Um, and I don't think I'll take my whole 10 minutes because I'm on the screen there and it's less compelling. Uh, but I just wanted to talk a little bit maybe about my experience being involved and then really more focus on kind of the lessons that I took away from the experience of being involved. Um, you know, it was a really, um, it started as a very uneventful um, Kind of typical movement i think there's been a lot of uh efforts to get chicano studies for more than more than 20 years uh prior to us being involved in this effort and it you wouldn't have known at the beginning that this was going to be the thing that won uh it didn't look i don't think much different from a lot of other things that have been tried over the years by a lot of other student organizers uh, so i spent some time trying to think about what i thought were the differences in what we did and maybe what may have led to some of our success that may not have happened uh, in prior iterations of this so uh, i think that part of the real energy behind uh, at least my own involvement i'll speak for myself was uh, right at the time that um, this started happening um, Cesar chavez passed away and it was very impactful, I think, for a lot of people, certainly for me, to realize that one of the real leaders for the Latino community was no longer with us and that you couldn't then rely on that sort of, um, you know, uh, figurehead to point to, to somebody that was really fighting on behalf of Latinos, even if it wasn't in the realm of what we were doing in the school environment. 
it was a very big absence for me uh, and, and led me to feel a real obligation to take my role seriously that I then had um, you know some responsibility to participate in advancing uh, my community at school um, and I think the other piece that really mobilized people was that there was a takeaway on the table or that there was a suggestion that they were going to close the Chicano Studies Library and that was a very real tangible resource that people used um, both for their academic pursuits and also for a social support network and it allowed people a place to gather to find ways to do the research that they wanted to in classes that weren't necessarily focused on Chicano issues. And there was a, a phenomenal staff resource there. And it really was a soft, welcoming place for a lot of students to go. And the, the you know, at least for my own involvement, the way I started to get involved was when the, that takeaway was admit, uh, announced by the administration that they were gonna close the library. And that for me felt very personal and let a, a real affront that in this in UCLA in the middle of Los Angeles in a public university where we didn't have Chicano studies then to say you can't even have a place to gather and study your history on your own time uh, really felt that it cut to the core for me and I think perhaps for other people um, so I think those were the things to me that I that I think are distinguishable perhaps from um, prior student efforts on the campus um, I think then what I would just kind of leap a little bit to some of the lessons I learned from that. Uh, I was, obviously all of this was happened organically. None of us went into it with roles or titles or anything that we were expected to do. Um, after we were arrested and then uh, released and we were trying to figure out what to do next to keep the pressure on and to force the administration, uh, the idea was raised of doing a hunger strike. And I was one of the people that was very nervous about doing that. I thought, um, I was concerned about our ability to pull it off. I was worried that we wouldn't be taken seriously and that we'd be putting people in jeopardy. Um, and so we had a pretty long discussion about whether we should or shouldn't do it, was it the right course of action? And at the end of that, there may have been um, multiple points of view, but we all agreed that we would do that and support one another in that. Um, during the process of identifying who was going to be a hunger striker, there was also a need to have other people supporting that effort. And so I was asked by the group to be uh, a negotiator with the administration. And I think that that, I don't know how it was that I was chosen, but I did feel uh, it really tapped into some of my kind of personal strengths and it uh, definitely fortified them as I continued through the process. And certainly has led me down the path I've gone today in terms of being an advocate um, and trying to speak up for other people. So I think uh, some of the personal lessons I learned was really around taking on a role that plays to your strengths and using that to benefit the movement. Um, and I also learned that uh, being as inclusive as possible is a real strength to any effort. I think in the past, at least in my years at UCLA, um, there was a fair amount, there was a pretty decent thread of folks that were pretty nationalistic about their, about the need for Chicano studies. And I, as a Central American, felt relatively excluded from a lot of that dialogue. Not so much in um, specific language, but just it felt different from my own experience. And I think one of the real strengths that we saw in this effort was that more students got engaged. Um, students that weren't traditionally in Metro or that weren't in some of the uh, political student organizations. There were also students from other ethnicities. There were, um, and I think that that really lent to the strength of the movement, and it lent, lent to the breadth of support that we experienced throughout both getting arrested and through the hunger strike. And so I took that in my own work as something very valuable that I learned from that. And then lastly, I would just say um, there, there's a real strength in being specific in the demands that you make. Um, having a very clear goal and how you want to get there, obviously, makes it much easier to measure when you've achieved success. Um, and for a lot of years, I think that it was hard to pinpoint, other than a department, how we were gonna get the things we wanted. And uh, as you all know, we didn't end up at the very end of the hunger strike with a department, but we got the backbone of what would become a department. And I think uh, having specificity around needing to have professors and needing to have space uh, those demands became very critical to building the backbone of what would eventually become a department. So 
those would be my uh, sort of takeaways from the experience. And I'd like to turn it over to both Josefina and Cindy are fantastic and we'll have a lot more to add. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I will now introduce um, to my right, Josefina Santiago, who is currently uh, the Associate Director of Workforce Development in Marina del Rey WorkSource Center in Marina del Rey, California, for the past 10 years. Josefina earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree in Sociology and her Bachelor of Arts degree in Chicana and Chicano Studies here at UCLA. While at uh, UCLA, Josefina was a member of Mecha de UCLA and was elected as the Women's Unit Coordinator. During the hunger strike, Josefina was also a student negotiator and in her role representing Mecha de UCLA at the table. After UCLA, Josefina earned her Master's of Arts degree curriculum in teaching at Columbia University in New York. Please join me in welcoming Josefina. Hi, everybody. I'm pleased to be here um, among such wonderful uh, people that really, really played a significant role in this incredible struggle. And um, just to, to kind of uh, piggyback off of what some of the things have already been said, um, nobody really defined what your role would be during this whole struggle, but we knew we had a, a, a mission in front of us, and that mission was to get Chicana and Chicano Studies. So I would concur with a lot of the things that have already been said. Um, my role as a mechista at the time was, was somewhat um, challenging because our organization, like many campuses, continuously had different leadership, and every four years there was a new leadership. And it, and it was a challenge. Mecha at that time was going through, through, through some serious transition. And so I think I was just a freshman when this whole thing started, or it felt like I was a freshman. But the moment I stepped in, it was like Mecha was, had one mission, and that was to have a Chicana Chicano Studies department. And what Mecha brought to the table was the fact that we had an infrastructure where there was a community of colleges and campuses just ready to be on call and in support of, of our mission and our struggle at the time. So the foundation for Chicana and Chicano Studies was really important and that was the, the part that Mecha I think really brought in. So I, want, I wouldn't say that it came from me, but rather it came from the struggles, um, like Christina mentioned, from, from previous struggles that had been uh, ongoing. Um, and the people at the time um, where uh, the new membership was coming in were, were quickly trying to catch up with what had already already happened and the, the plans that were already made. And some of us, especially the uh, younger ones at the time, were, were trying to figure out, well, what is Chicana Chicano Studies? <laughs> well, what, what, why, why such a huge emphasis in it? So we were, at the same time, folks were trying to graduate and, 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 and move on with their lives and, and throwing uh, as much knowledge as possible to, to the younger generations um, at, when I stepped in. And then again, it, we didn't step in and everything was laid out, here's the plan, Here, here's how you're gonna do the next step. It was, it was uh, trial and error, it was a lot of um, also challenges even amongst uh, Mecha ideology and I'm sure um, uh, Cindy can, can share some of that with us as well because there was some folks that very, very strong nationalist um, machistas and then others that were in, in the Hanista um, and, and very, very, very uh, kind of different approach. And there was turmoil at, at, at every step of the way. I'm surprised um, we managed to, to get so far. Um, but again, it was because of the passion and the heart at, at, the, at, the, at the core of things that continued to, to lend itself and, uh, and being the, the right cause. So um, Mecha playing that uh, critical role in laying that foundation, um, having the infrastructure of being able to network relatively quickly across the state. Uh, as you know, Mecha has Mecha Central and Mecha, Mecha National and um, some of the mechistas were ready to uh, share their best practices with, with the UCLA members. Um, and when, it, <laughs> I don't even think we had a Mecha meeting in, in like, I don't know, a few months, 
and we were kind of meeting as as needed after more meetings that we had um, during uh, all this all this activism that was happening. So um, there wasn't much time to gather everybody around and, and talk about what to do next. It was like we have to have this meeting and it's going to happen after we meet with the chancellor or after um, the decision is made as to who's going to be the negotiator. It was like constant meeting after meeting. Um, so so Mecha never said, oh, Josefina, you should be the person to to go and represent it. It was just like, you've been to all meetings, so congrats, you're, you're going to be at the forefront of this. Um, and and what we did know was that whoever it was that was going to take on that lead had to be informed with what Mecha um, encompassed, as well as knowing that we wanted uh, Mecha to be at the forefront of Chicana and Chicano studies. And I think that was the, the critical role that, that, that I played at, at that time. Again, without necessarily um, uh, being structurally or, or, or forming it at the time, it, 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 it was organic, it, 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 uh, it happened in an organic way. Um, at the same time, um, I think that some of the key players during the hunger strike were um, outside uh, agencies that had a history with Mecha, such as um, the Mothers of East LA, who, who knew what uh, Mecha was stood by at that time and, and what it represented. Um, the Alliance, who some of the, I saw somebody here that um, had already done a lot of the legwork for Chicana and Chicano studies and uh, was supportive of Beta the UCLA at the time, um, as well as um, some of the other colleges, as I mentioned before, um, or, or rather, um, Jose mentioned before, East LA College and Cerritos College playing a critical role in coming out in numbers and supporting the, the, the struggle. And I also want to, um, uh, last but not least, introduce uh, Cindy Montañez. Uh, Cindy Montañez, as a lot of you know, was one of the hunger strikers here at UCLA um, during the two-week period in 1993. She committed to this cause and fasted along with Juan Arturo Diaz Lopez, Marcos Aguilar, Balvina Collazo, Maria Lara, Professor Jorge Mancias, Norma Montañez, and, Juan, and Joaquin Manuel Ochoa. Cindy is a history maker um, in, in, in the area of civics. She is a leader who is currently a candidate for Los Angeles City Council. And uh, at the age of 28, Cindy was the youngest woman ever elected to the California State Legislature and the first Democratic woman to chair the powerful Assembly Rules Committee. Two years after joining the City Council, Cindy became mayor of the city of San Fernando. Cindy is a lifelong resident of the San Fernando Valley currently living in Van Nuys and serves as a board member of the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Cindy. Thank you, uh, and muy buenas tardes a todos. Uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you to, to Pepe uh, for inviting us to be part of this. I think we, we got together through Michael, one of, uh, one of my close friends and who was part of our, our team out of the valley. We got together a few months ago and he was doing the interviews for a lot of oral histories and interviews of people that had been involved in, uh, in the effort to establish the, the Chicano and Chicano Studies Department here at UCLA. So it's great when you said that we were going to, you were thinking about bringing everybody together to do a 20 year commemoration of the hunger strike or that effort, because it really just wasn't about the hunger strike. The hunger strike was part of the effort to establish the, uh, the Chicano and Chicano Studies Department here at UCLA. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate the leadership um, here at UCLA um, in the Chicano Studies Research Center, at the in the department, and just really throughout the campus. Everybody that has continued, that has stayed here, and continued to work either directly here on campus as faculty members or staff, students, um, and those of us from the outside too that continue to really keep this keep the uh, Chicano and Chicano Studies uh, strong here at, at UCLA because. University of California in Los Angeles, you live in Los Angeles, if you don't have the Chicano and Chicano Studies Research Center, library, department, you're just not doing your job. 
in Los Angeles for education. So thank you to everybody and to the students that are part of the program. Take advantage of everything you possibly can. I mean, you will hear if you haven't already done research or been here, you know, taking classes. It was a lot of struggle, a lot of effort that came from way before 1993. Today, maybe we celebrate, you know, 20 years, but before, since prior to 1969, as Dr. Raul Brees was talking about, the efforts that, that went into establishing these, uh, these, uh, the, the, the teaching institutions, the research, are incredible. You have to take it. I was, I studied math a lot. I was on the other side of campus, but I always took, you know, the, the Chicano and Chicano studies classes. So take advantage of the programs, take classes. So I'll just talk a, lot, a little bit about my involvement and how I got involved. I, um, my brother Miguel was actually a student here at UCLA prior to me coming to UCLA. So my brother Miguel, um, Josefina knows, and others that were here uh, prior, he was really involved. He was involved as a, as a student activist, um, directly through Mecha, sometimes not. I think, you know, Josefina's right. Sometimes students would come in and out of Mecha. And it was just, it was great. It's wonderful that students have, you know, different different sets of opinion and approaches as to how they identify themselves as Chicana and Chicano students. So my brother Miguel was really involved. And I remember as a high school student, my dad would take us sometimes to you know, UC Santa Barbara, protest here, marches, rallies, all over. And so I always thought, you know, as I was deciding where do I want to go to college, this was one of the reasons that I absolutely knew I wanted to come to UCLA, without a doubt. I felt that I could be get an amazing education, world-class education, but still be part of a movement for social justice and education reform and educational justice. And so I came to UCLA as a young, you know, 18-year-old, and it was my first year. I graduated from, um, from high school in 1992. I started here um, in 1992. And, in, and throughout the, the, the time I was here, I had a wonderful introduction to UCLA. I get to UCLA, and the first day, a couple of days into, uh, into being here on campus, there's a big da uh, Daily Bruin story that talks about this song. It was a song don done by a fraternity to, this, to the tune of Gilligan's Island that talks about you know, raping women Latinas seeing their bodies with maggots. And it was this horrible, disgusting song. And so Mecha and other students had organized these candlelight vigils at a fraternity. This was my introduction to UCLA. Okay? <laughs> this is how I got introduced to UCLA. So I was kind of obviously you know, silly when I said it was a wonderful introduction. But it was a, a campus that I you know, clearly continued to be very involved with. So it just immediately, even though I wasn't part of any student organization, I always maintained you know, what I thought was just you know, good, respectful relationships with a lot of students that were very actively involved with, with, uh, with different organizations. So whenever there was a rally, whenever there was something like, I would show up. And I wasn't the student leader, you know, so however you identify yourself as students. You know, I wasn't the one with the microphone. I wasn't the one you know, with the creative signs. I wasn't the one that had what I felt any real significant skills or talents or whatever to contribute besides feeling in my heart that we were doing the right thing. And feeling in my heart that I wanted to be supportive of the, of the work that a lot of the other students were doing and trying to contribute in whatever way I possibly could. So we go through, you know, where here we are, and there's, you know, different activity going on um, during this time. And, and remember, if you read the history, there was a, a couple years prior to this that the, the university had basically said, we're shutting down this program. There's not going to be any more students that are going to be admitted to, 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 uh, to take classes at, um, you know, in, in the Chicano and Chicano Studies Center. So then there was an effort back then. There had been efforts, all effort after effort, that, that, that students had done to try to establish the Chicano and Chicano Studies Department at UCLA. Here I am, my first year. Um, fast forward to, you know, May 11th, which is when the big, uh, when 99 students, right, Christine? I think it was 99 students get arrested. Uh, they hold a, a, a there's a big, actually, um, protest sit-in at the faculty center and the, and the administration building. 99 students get arrested. A lot of those students get sent to county, to county jail. They literally oh. get booked. How many? All of us. All of us. All the students get, 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 they literally, innocent, young, hardworking, smart, talented young people get arrested and booked and handcuffed in buses and shipped. And Christine should probably talk about this a little bit more. <laughs> to county, county jail. I was in a class, um, so by the time I got there, they had already shut down all the, uh, no one was able to get in. So I wasn't able to be part of that, that experience, but on the outside. 
So they had us, those of us that were on the outside, trying to make calls, right? Trying to call others to like, and there's Gabby too, who was, you know, really involved, like, um, you know, trying to really like, um, you know, trying to get us involved in making phone calls and doing everything else that, that, that we could do. So May, so May 11th, these students get arrested. And I think that really was the point where it just didn't stop. From that point forward, it didn't stop. There was a coalition of students called the Conscious Students of Color. And Christine could really talk about this, I think, a lot more um, than, than I can. But the Conscious Students of Color was a diverse group of students. There was Asian students, Latino students, students, you know, Mexican American students. There was, you know, there were students that were from the LGBT community, um, African American students, uh, uh, women from the women's departments or women's studies center. I mean, it was a really broad base of students that came together to say, we're going to work together and we're going to keep, we're, we're going to fight as, you know, conscious students of color to protect the ethnic studies centers and libraries here at UCLA. Because during that time, the university budget was actually calling for the elimination or consolidation. I think at that time it was the elimination of the, of the ethnic studies libraries. We would not have had the Chicano Studies Library and all the other ethnic studies libraries had students not come together and said, we are going to stick together as students from multiple ethnicities. We're going to come together and we're going to defend our libraries. And of course, the students that were very active with the Chicano and Chicano Studies movement said, we want our Chicano and Chicano Studies Department. We have been pushing for this department for years. We want to make sure that we get our Chicano and Chicano Studies Department. And then the demand came, as you know, as Pepe was saying, the third demand was, we want to make sure that all the, the students that actually had charges filed against them for doing nothing more than asking for educational justice at the University of California in Los Angeles, one of the most incredible universities in the world, asking for ethnic studies, libraries, and departments. There was nothing wrong, there was nothing criminal about that. But somehow, you ask for that, you end up at Kennedy Dale. So, uh, so, so we, we kept doing marches, and there was, there was rallies. And on the eve of Cesar Chavez's death, we, oh no, the, the, the wake, actually, he had already passed away. And so there was the, it was the, the wake, he was gonna be buried. That's the day, that's the, 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 that eve is when the chancellor decides to tell everybody, we are denying we are denying UCLA the ability to have the Chicana and Chicano Studies Department on the eve. So you have people that are, you know, they're in the Central Valley, they're they're at the at the at the wake. Um, you have clearly a, a very significant historical moment for anybody who believes in issues of social justice, and especially in the in the you know in the Chicana and Chicano Studies uh, or the Chicana and Chicano community. That on that eve, he basically denies. The chancellor denies the ability for the university to have its department. So that was just, you know, one of those big things that just got everybody together and said, no way are we just going to allow this uh, allow this to happen. So we started organizing, and then we decided a few days after that that um, that we kept asking, writing letters, making phone calls, making the request, have the, the chancellor change his his perspective now. So then when we, we decided um, that we needed to do something different. We had done rallies, we had done sit-ins, we had done marches, we had done you know, letter writing campaigns, we had made phone calls, we had you know, the United Community Labor Alliance, which was you know, a group of community members and labor unions and activists and everybody coming together. And it was this no, 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 no. So at, point, oh, at some point you think, okay, you've been told no enough, what else can you do? <coughs> so we made a decision, you know, as Josefina had said, lots of people coming together, right, in this discussion, which was a really intense discussion, very intense discussion, as to whether or not we should do the strike. So then the idea came up, and so it was like, okay, we're going to do, let's do a hunger strike, and I think Marcos like, Aguilar was the one that, that brought that up. Marcos was like, we got to take it to the next level, let's do a hunger strike. And uh, there was that discussion, and finally it's like, okay, who's in and who's out? So, you know, Jorge Mancias, you know, Maria Lara, Joaquin Ochoa, there was a whole group, of, you know, as Bebe mentioned, that said, we're in, I said I'm in. Um, I went home, um, you know, they talked to us, a few days later, they had some of the, the doctors from UCLA come talk to us, and they basically said, this is what happens to your body if you stop eating. If you don't, deny your body of food, this is what happens the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. I nearly fainted. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> but uh, so I went home and I told uh, you know my mom and my dad that this is what we're gonna do. And then my younger sister, Norma, was there and she was listening to this conversation. And here she is as a, a senior um, in high school, as an 18 year old. And 17, I guess, at that time. 
and she said, you know, she was listening to me talking, and my dad's like, hey, we're the ones that taught you this. We're the ones that, you know, we're teaching you all these values that, that you have, and I've stood with you. I've stood with your brother Miguel. I've stood with you. We stood with, you know, with all the efforts that students have done. We will support you. If this is what you're going to do, we will absolutely support you, and we will do everything we possibly can to be on radio shows, to go talk to you know churches, to go talk to high schools, to do whatever we have to do to do our part to make sure that our kids, our two daughters, do not die. Because we were serious. We were absolutely serious about going all the way to make sure that we got the, the, the Chicano and Chicano Studies Department at UCLA. And we went 14 days. I cannot believe now, because I, you know, come like 11.30 in the morning, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I did 14 days. So we uh, so we did it, and we, they were amazing, especially the women. The women were the ones, really, that were running the show. These women, I mean, we were just sitting there, you know, not eating. We didn't even eat. We didn't do anything. But they were just organized. They were organizing the press. They were organizing uh, community members. They were organizing labor. They were organizing high schools. They had kindergarten kids. I mean, it was like an amazing movement, amazing movement that came from students. They came from students at UCLA and then started branching out and reaching out to other to other to other students that came from other from other campuses. And within a matter of days, I think within four days, Joaquin was the first one that got really sick. And so Joaquin, I mean, he ended up, if you see him on the pictures, that he ended up in a wheelchair um, very, very soon. So his body was the one that really reacted, you know, the, the most severely very early on. So when when, when Joaquin got really sick, then then all of a sudden you started getting all this press that started coming in, right? Press started coming in from everywhere. Um, and it was a result of the efforts of people like, you know, like Christine and others, Claudia Alvarez and others that were organizing, you know, the, the, uh, the you know, the kind of the, the, the press and, and the effort to take this outside of UCLA, because we knew we couldn't do it alone. We knew we needed everybody from, from other campuses and outside the community. So, um, so, so this effort continues and it just grows. We had a, a tent, so imagine this big army tent just set, up, set up outside here um, in, the, in the quad outside. And then there was smaller tents. Every, every night there'd be a new tent and a new tent and some new tent that would go up. People would come and they would say, we're gonna fast food for one day. You had little kids that were these kids, I'll never forget, the kids that were kindergartners that would come and just say, like, we're with you. We want you got on Chicano studies, you know, and we're not going to chew gum until the chancellor gives us <laughs> a Chicano Chicano studies department. Kids that were little mariachis would come, and there was Don Santos, and it was just, uh, you know, an amazing social movement. It was an amazing social movement that I will never in my life forget, and that I learned so much about how you organize and how you bring people together and how you make change in a very positive, progressive, thoughtful. You know, organized manner. So um, towards the, you know, after you know these 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 during this time, there was negotiations that were going on. We were going in, we we're meeting with the chancellor. There was all these these com these conversations, and I think finally one of the big things that happened is I remember towards the end there was a huge huge march that happened from La Placita Olvera, so from Olvera Street, which is at least 25, 26 miles from here. People started a march at Placita Olvera and marched all the way down Wilshire Boulevard to UCLA. There was a few, maybe 100 that started. By the time that march got here to UCLA, down Wilshire Boulevard, there was thousands, thousands of people that joined that march. Truly an amazing sight for Los Angeles. Because you, you could just imagine as you're coming down Wilshire Boulevard and this huge high rises, and you have people, you know, drumming their drums and like, you know, making noise. And, and they got, the people got to UCLA and you couldn't, you, the, the feeling was just overwhelming. And I think that's when the university really realized this is a big movement. This is something that goes beyond, you know, just these student activists at UCLA. Because, you know, universities have dealt with activism throughout the years. And they have been able to, at times, support it and other times suppress it. In this, in this situation, it moved beyond to students. It really was about the community. So all the community members that helped, I mean, we really have to say thank you to them because we would have never, ever been able to do this without the support of the community. So shortly thereafter, that big march happens, we, we sign, you know, we, we have an agreement, and, and the university never gave us everything we wanted. It was, it, we, we got the Cesar Chavez Center for Interdisciplinary Instruction for Chicano and Chicano Studies. That's what we got. 
And, but what did it mean? It meant essentially we had a lot of the elements of the department. One of the key elements was you, have, you had to have a budget that was specifically funding this, the, the department or the center, and we got that. So it was technical issues, but ultimately we got that. Um, but it still wasn't a department, obviously, until 2005, when it officially became a department. So anyway, so when I think about you know this whole this whole movement and what happened, um, I go back to, and especially for the for the students that are here, is that you you do truly have to appreciate the history, the years and years of history and movements and efforts of people that have done this for a long much longer period of time. You know, my time here at UCLA was short. You know, it was four or five years compared to this movement that has been on going on for years and years and years and years, even prior to like 1969. So what we have to do, we have a responsibility to maintain it, to support it, to expand it, to grow it, to ensure its, its continued, su continued success, be, and, and to make sure that generations after you know, generations continue to have that ability to, to come to you know, one of the best universities in the world and have you know, a rigorous academic teaching and research uh, department that will help us in, in how we move, how we solve problems that we have in our community and how we truly become you know a true agent a continue continuous agent of change of social justice and social change because that's ultimately what this is about so anyways that's a list a little bit of you know my what I kind of remember there's a lot of things you know I think we could, we could talk for hours and hours of like a lot of details and special moments and not so special moments and times like you know that now you laugh at but during that time you're really angry like you know frat boys coming around and throwing tortillas at you <laughs> now you've laughed but during that time it's like here they are throwing you know tortillas at you when you're starving i mean during that time what do you do you take offense later on you know 20 years later you could say that you could just kind of you know laugh and tell younger students about these stories and just like you know no you just move forward you stay focused you move forward like i said you have a thoughtful organized you know, plan that you could execute on and you'll have success in the movements that, 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 that we, I think, all care about, which is, you know, again, fundamentally it comes to social justice and educational, you know, change and reform, and that's, I think, what we all believe in. Thank you so much. At this point, um, we would like to invite a couple of questions for the panelists uh, from the audience. If anybody would uh, like to ask a question, we would love to hear from you. and get a couple of questions answered. After this, I want to invite everyone to join us in the balcony um, where we have a uh, little reception set up for all of us. So uh, let me begin to see if there are any questions from the audience for our panelists. We'll start here. Can I pass you a microphone? Yes, uh, I'm Dr. John Fernandez. Uh, in 1978, I was the first Chicano to get a B in Chicano Studies here at UCLA. Uh, in 2003, I got my PhD here in the School of Education. I taught uh, 31 years and 24 years at Roosevelt High School. My question is, what is the status right now of the department? Because uh, apparently, I don't know if there's any people from the department here in terms of how many majors I know there's a PhD program that's very significant. Does anybody know like how many majors there are? Uh, how many, you know, there's a master's degree program. What type of projects that uh, the department is uh, involved in right now at this time? I could say some, but I, I know Professor Blackwell's here too, and she could probably speak a little bit more to that. I don't know if you have. Do you want to take a round of questions and then I'll answer it? Let's address that question first. Do you want to go ahead and then Everyone. I'm really honored to be here. I'm Professor Maylee Blackwell. I've been in the department, uh, the Cesare Chavez department, and finally got named. Um, it's one of the only uh, units in the whole UC system that's named after an individual. It was a huge, you know, um, honor to be able to um, just remember the, the hunger strike and all the efforts and the student power and community power and labor power. So the department's been growing uh, with the support of still community and students, and it uh, launched its PhD program this year. We have a cohort um, of current PhD students, um, and we've already accepted our second cohort. So our first cohort has six students, and um, we are still one of, we're a quite large major. I don't have the active numbers, but we usually have um, 
gosh, I, don't, I can't even remember, but between majors and minors, hundreds, like hundreds of majors and minors every year, and I don't have the current numbers. Um, we need Ali for that, Ali, our wonderful student advisor, but um, the department continues to be very active. We have an integrated MA PhD program, so students get their MA en route to PhD, and it's the one of the only um, programs that integrates the arts, so you know, with our faculty like Judy Baca and uh, the performing and creative arts and writing, with you know, our focus on you know labor and policy, on transnational, um, you know, social movements. I'm a social movement scholar. I also work on women in the in the Chicano movement. Um, so I, the department I think has a ten and a half, eleven faculty. I don't know. It's growing. Eleven actually, eleven and a half now. The update I have. I don't know. Pepe's been a TA for us for a hundred years. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have other graduates. We have so many different perspectives here. I would just add that our intro course, our Chicano Chicano Studies 10A intro course, um, uh, pulls in about 450 students each fall. So, so that on its own tells you that, um, and, and it's a very diverse intro course where you have students of diverse backgrounds because it not only meets the requirement for our major and minor, but it also meets the requirement for general education. So a very smart move on behalf of the department and, and a very uh, uh, great way to recruit uh, Chicano, Chicano students uh, to become uh, majors and minors. So we had another question here? Yeah, um, Rosalio Munoz and I was involved in, Rosalio, you need that. Oh, I was here and I was on a committee that they called a, a task force in the summer of 68 where we came up with the high potential program and I kind of was a spokesman for UMAS on that and Juan Lopez for the for the study center and we met with Chuck Young about those things and he you know the obvious thing is we were also wanted classes and that kind of thing at that time of the, there's not the PhDs out there you know in the Chicano community you kind of you know that was there was some reality to that but he was talking in terms of as that grew our academic community grew there would be more so I had a, some role in the community efforts with John and others um, on, on getting political support. But I, I wanted to know, um, one, what happened with the, the uh, court charges, and two, uh, how empowering did you feel uh, being on the fast was for you? All 99 of us were arrested on felony vandalism charges. That's what got us to county jail instead of getting a ticket at the back of the faculty center and getting sent to home. Uh, so the women were sent to Civil Brand and the men were sent to Men's Central Jail. And we were there for two days. Um, our bail was, I don't remember what it was, but it was several hundred thousand dollars. So most of us could not bail out. Um, which is why we spent the two days there. Um, and while we were there, just anecdotally, you know, we got there, we were all very scared, obviously. <laughs> and um, we started out very fearful of what the jail was going to be like. And what ended up happening was that the female inmates were really supportive of us. Um, and the guards were really the challenge that we faced while we were there. Um, after we were processed and put in, they put us all in a different... Um, we were all in blue, and then they put us into a unit with women all wearing green. And then they told us, these are the women that have committed crimes since they've been here, so good luck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we walked in very fearful. We had no idea what we were getting into. And uh, as it turned out, the women were exceptionally supportive of us. And the, that we went that night, and then the next morning, it was a big picture on the LA Times of all of us getting arrested. And we got that in the jail, and the women were passing it around. They were like, oh, look, here you are. Here's your friend. Oh, hey, yeah. And, you know, they wanted to talk about it. And we had a really fabulous conversation in there with several women uh, about what we were doing, and they were quite supportive of it. Um, after the two days, we got to call in uh, to request a release on our own recognizances. Uh, so we all lined up to do that, and then we slowly got processed out. After that, about a week later, um, seven people didn't, uh, were filed formal charges against for the vandalism. And I think they were all men, and it was men that they believed had caused damage to the faculty center during the uh, protest that led to the sit-in. 
Um, and those charges dragged on for quite a while. We were able to get, um, oh, I can't remember his name, but there was a really great Chicano lawyer that volunteered his time to help out. He did it pro bono. Was it for? Uh, okay, right? Yeah. So Jorge and he got some friends, and so they uh, represented the seven of them. I was not one of them. They represented the seven of them pro bono, and eventually got the charges dropped. So nobody, they did have one court appearance, and then after that, the, they got the charges dropped. So nobody faced any ultimate sanctions um, from the sit-in or the protest. Now, if, if you go into the faculty center today in the <laughs> coffee room, there is a large painting done by Gronk. Um, yeah. That painting was part of the negotiations that was given to, donated by Gronk as compensation to the faculty center for the damages that were done. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> The other question, the the feeling of being on that, that hunger strike, or well, in terms of the empowerment, right? oh, the empowerment. So I think that the the whole hunger strike, whether you were taking taking part, you were participating as a hunger striker, or you were, um, you know, students that were there on these shifts, right? There would be students that would sit there, and they would be like uh, caretakers or security, and then. They would shift like every four hours or so. And then there was uh, people, students that were with the Chicanos for Community Medicine. And you see the picture there of like that students come first and there's this young man there with his hand up this, like this. That is now a member of the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. Raul that's Reese it? is now a member of the United States that's Congress. That's his name? Mm -hmm. Member of the United States Congress just got elected in November um, in the, out in, in Coachella. So you had people like that who was here and went off to, to, to Harvard um, Medical School, and you could probably go on and, and kind of list a lot of these folks and all the all the risk, everything that people did. As I said, there was a group that was uh, like Kathy Cho and others had a group that were dealing with, uh, you know, the press. People like Enrique, who's here, was like helping with a lot of these students that were coming in, supporters. You know, so Sabina was talking about from other campuses and, you know, mental chapters and, uh, and other places. And so I think that it was really, the danzantes, you know, Marcos Aguilar and, and uh, Paste, they were all very involved as a group of danzantes that would, that, that, you know, there was danzas every morning and throughout, you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the day. Um, and it goes on and on. So I think it absolutely was very empowering, absolutely, for um, anybody that was involved to say that you could use, you know, also, it's like through cultural, like, um, there's cultural elements or things that we have culturally that are just very empowering in the music. I mean, when you're feeling really down and you're hungry and you're just, you know, if you're alone, you, you just like, you get more depressed. But when you have music, I mean, you could be dancing and singing and, you know, for hours and hours and hours and not realize that you're hungry. So all of that really helped. And I do think that it was absolutely, you know, more than anything empowering for a community, a community as a whole. To say that you know, in in a place like UCLA, that if we come together um, in an organized fashion, that we actually that we absolutely can make a change and make a difference. So um, when I think about my life and the things that I've gotten done, this this struggle was definitely one of the ones that taught me at a pretty young age, at 19 years old, that don't give up, keep going forward. And if you've got you know a, a focus, a plan, an objective, and a lot of people supporting you, you most likely, more likely than not, will be successful. A few more questions, yes. Pass the microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marilena Fernandez. I was a graduate. Hello. <laughs> I was a graduate student here. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Um, I just wanted to share. I'm, I feel so proud right now. I don't think I really understood how amazing it was, you okay. know, what you all did. and. Um, I don't know how come how come I'm the only one who's emotional. I'm like <laughs> that's um, Yeah, I mean I was a, I was you know on the sidelines, but I was here. You know I was I think I, I I think I was on one of those shifts. I don't know. I remember hauling water or something. I don't know. But I was around, and I just want to share a little bit of of you know from my perspective. I remember that night when uh, students were arrested, and we were all outside. And actually, I went home and 
I knew Jorge Gonzalez, I don't know, through a friend, Lisa Duran, who was involved in supporting later, and I, I called him to come out, and he came out, and it's like, anyway, I'm so happy that <laughs> that all worked out so beautifully. And Thank you for calling him. I know, right? Que bueno que se me ocurrió. And I... And I can't, I'm surprised that I don't remember the big march. I don't know why I can't remember that march from the Wilshire Boulevard. I do remember that I was um, one of the, I did help to organize a, uh, one of the last rallies on the steps of, I can't remember the, Royce? of, uh, Royce no, 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 in Murphy. front of, across Murphy. from the law school. Oh. Murphy. Murphy. Murphy, Murphy, right. Yeah, and so I kind of remember that, but um, anyway, I'm just so proud, and, and thank you so much for putting it all in perspective. I didn't realize that Cesar Chavez's death had such an, you know, pivotal impact on the inspiration. I, I just feel so proud that I was, you know, somehow a, a, a part of this. So thank you so much. I remember we were so in awe of Cindy. We're like, man, she's just a freshman. Yeah, she's just a freshman. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, has UCLA ever acknowledged uh, uh, responsibility for its uh, almost um, violation that they committed against, uh, in particular students that were arrested, uh, regardless of whether or not they were, the charges were dropped? <coughs> just the fact that this university went ahead and and persecuted, and uh, supposedly because of some damage that may or may not have been done by the students. Have they ever, in all those years, acknowledged, uh, regardless of whether or not there's a center, their responsibility uh, of malfeasance almost, as far as I'm concerned, the way they treated the community, and in particular the students? And if so, have they done something to institutionalize, let's say, for example, a fund uh, for the creation of a scholarship for students based on the hunger strike. Um, because the hunger strike was a very, as all of you have, have uh, reflected on, super positive. It uh, shows real civic commitment, something that we should celebrate and not something that should be forgotten or, or, or pushed aside. It seems to me this institution has the responsibility to acknowledge its, its, its behavior by maybe instituting something here and especially commending officially all those involved, which, you know, it's, it's very courageous, very significant, and I'm not from UCLA and I don't think they have. I think it's sort of like been late dormant, but this is the should. It, it, uh, it's become a better the administration knew it was going to happen so there's a lot of memorandums and stuff that they had to release for my research so the university knew it was going to happen and the university decided to fly Chancellor Young to Japan on vacation so Chancellor Young was not on site when uh, the faculty center protest happened um, as usually happens student leaders in the room know this that you plan an organizational protest and you show up and the chancellor is miraculously not there it's all purposeful in, in that matter. So same thing that day. He was in Japan. Um, Executive Vice Chancellor um, on record has said that um, she called LAPD because she was told that the people outside were gangsters from East Los Angeles. Um, and that they had, um, that they had chains. Not even from San Fernando She looks like a gangster. She looks like a gangster from East LA, right, Christine? So, um, uh, long story short, um, uh, the university uh, was pushing, uh, was going to um, go as far as possible with the seven male students, um, but because that was one of the demands of the hunger strike, um, they, were, they dropped the charges, but the students, the seven, still had to pay the damages. So that's something that is often not written in history, is that yes, the charges were dropped, but they still had to pay. So Gronk's uh, painting covered part of that, but they had to have their own parties and fundraisers to fundraise their way out of that or else they weren't gonna be able to get their degrees from UCLA. And some of these you know, uh, members that I've interviewed, um, you know, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're you know, community organizers and such, so imagine, you know, and the community came together for them as well. So 
in, in some no, the university still believes that they did the right thing. Um, um, uh, I had the, 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 the pleasure to interview uh, Chancellor Young and, and the administration, and in that they, they still believe that they did the right thing, and that all of this was just a circus gone out of hand, um, in their words. One more question, can I, and then can we, I say oh, something yes, about that? Yes. I just want to, you know, when we planned the sit in, we figured it would that the chancellor would be stubborn, so it would take a couple of days before he would come to meet with us. So, uh, literally, uh, Blanca, Bordo, and I put toothpaste and toothbrushes and deodorant into our backpacks because we thought we're going to be here for a couple of days before he finally realizes we're serious and comes to meet with us. We have, obviously, we didn't know he was in Japan. <laughs> But uh, even through the whole thing, uh, getting arrested, then weeks after of doing, you know, smaller demonstrations that we were all involved in, and then ultimately in the hunger strike, when when uh, we, Mario and I don't know, Josefina, if you were with us, and we went to go talk to the administration, we never met with Chancellor Young. We always met with Winston Doby and others. We never ever saw the chancellor in all of that negotiation. And there would be five or six administrators in the room um, sitting on taller chairs and they would give us lower chairs and they would yell at us and try to intimidate us that so they really took a hard line through the whole process I'd have to say um, I've never met Chancellor Young to this day <laughs> can we get one last question and then I want to invite us to interact yes oh the food leaves at six so at this <laughs> point um, let's go ahead and wrap this up I want to thank everyone for being here uh, let's thank our panelists one last time um, and we want to invite everyone to join us on the balcony please there's uh, plenty of food so uh, please uh, stop by and, and have a bite with us